You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. Blair, we are going to talk today about work-life balance. You know what I mean by that phrase? I was thinking, though, there's got to be a better way to think about this. Well, I'm a Libra. You're a what? I'm a Libra. What is? I don't even know what I am, so what does that have to do with this? What do you mean you don't know what you are? When I were have you born? no idea. Of course, I'm not going to. I don't know enough, but uh, all I, I'm, a, I'm a Libra. Balance is very important to me. I, for years, I used to say, what did I used to say? I used to say, uh, the secret to life is balance. No. Well, apparently, <laughs> balance is more important to you than memory. <laughs> I have no yeah. idea. I got my 23 and Me results back a little while ago. And one of the things that shows is I, I have very poor memory. It shows up genetically. Oh, I tried to do... I tried to do one of those 23 and Me kits, but I couldn't spit enough, so I admire your <laughs> spitting ability. So here we are talking about work-life balance. Is that the right phrase? Let's start with that. What, like, it, is that the best thing to call that? It just feels, maybe it's just overused and it's fine, but... Yeah, there... I was, when we were batting this around, I was thinking time, like, I have time on the brain, and like, my, I'm telling myself, okay, Blair, what you're going to, what you're not going to do is you're not going to talk about the physics of time, but I think I'll... I've gone down the rabbit hole of time. So I'm, and he, so we're recording on a Friday. I go on vacation at five o'clock today for two and a half weeks. Right. And I think that was the impetus for this right. is just thinking ahead to the vacation and the value of time, t- time off, how much a principle of a firm should work. Um, what are the expectations around impl- the amount of time employees should put in? Um, so there's so much to cover here. You can call it work-life balance, or you can call it time. Okay, but. so let me start by just getting some basic numbers down. You, <clears throat> How much time do you typically take off a year, defining that as not necessarily away from, the, away from your town, but, but you're disconnected from the business? How, how many days would that include in a year? Yeah, and I'm, as you're answering, beginning to ask the question, I'm feeling, oh, like nowhere near enough. I used to be so proud of, of when I started tracking time off. The first year I started tracking time off, I think I took nine weeks off. And it's less than that now? Oh, it's so much less than that now. So in, in Strategic Coach, which is the entrepreneurial coaching program that I attend, I've attended for a few years now, they uh, they define a free day as a 24-hour period from mm-hmm. midnight to midnight where you do not uh, work or think deeply about work. Okay. And that, that includes checking email or any communications. So that's a free day. Um, by that definition, how many free days do I take in a year? Probably maybe 14 Ah. Like to, to, and you think your how many do your employees get? About one hundred and thirty-five. Right. <laughs> so something maybe you should be an employee. I guess we could just fast forward there. So how long are you typically gone when you take like whatever this trip is? It is it usually a week or two weeks? Like I've noticed one of the things that's really different about, in different parts of the world is how much time consecutive contiguous time people take off in the u.s versus like germany Canada, Germ- the europe uh australia yeah. where they're typically taking they save it up and take a month off at a time it seems like yeah like we live in a little tourist town it's quite touristy in the summer and uh so i've met some uh german relatives of friends d- two different sets so far this summer who are over here and they're over here for five weeks at a time like we don't uh we, I don't know how many of them are entrepreneurs, um, but we do not – we we culturally, and I'm including you know Canada and the United States, so in North America, I don't think we, we place a value on rejuvenation the way that some other cultures do. And, and some people might respond well, that, well, that's part of our economic success of our culture is that right. we work so hard. Yeah. I don't think that's the case at all. I think the economic success of North America lies in our freedom to fail, our propensity for risk, um, which is a cultural thing that is actually quite rare in other parts of the world. I don't think it's because we work harder, but I think there's this uh, uh, illusion where uh, – 
it's this fantasy. It's, I, th- I think we're a lot of us, especially owners of businesses, we're kind of guided by this idea that um, we need to work harder. And that's and really, this episode isn't about digging deep into our personal vacation lives. It's really to help principals think about what, like, what is the strategy and what's the impact? How do you? I am I am just blown away at how little time principals take off. And so, let me ask you a question that might have multi part answers about the impact of that. So. If we have a principal who's not taking a lot of time off, and it actually seems to be more difficult for them if they don't have partners because they feel like, oh, it's a little harder for coverage back at the firm and so on. What happens to them? And maybe you could use yourself as an example if that's comfortable. And then what happens to the firm if they aren't taking enough time off? Or maybe maybe we shouldn't even – maybe it's more about if they're not constantly being rejuvenated. What happens in these areas? What What bad things slowly start to happen? I think I can perceive things happening in my clients' businesses, but I really only know this to be true from my own experience. And I don't think of myself as an all that productive person. I'm a sprinter. So I get up and sprint and then I have to lie down for a while. And if I do not build in times of the year where I'm able to lie down, then I'm unable to sprint. And there's been a period of time probably going on two years where I just – it was because I wasn't lying down in the form of vacation – it was just a slog. And I, I said 14 free days in the last year. That's it's actually more than that because we do take, we do. I I I always take time off in March. Um, I always take time off in the summer, and I try to take time off around kind of November, December, and then an extended Christmas break. So we do stuff in January too after our event together. Yeah, yeah, right. And right. we're doing it again this year, doing an event, and then going on vacation together. So I have this dilemma. I've got two and a half weeks of vacation coming up and I've got a couple things undone. So I know I should actually have full free days where I do not think deeply about work. Yeah. And part of me is already preparing to cheat. I know if I cheat and I think deep and I do so get up early in the morning and do a couple of things and I tell myself, well, it's writing, so it's not really work. Yeah. Um, I know I will pay the price when I come back. I know that if I'm able to free myself up even for half of that, if I could take half of it, the front half or the back half, and just absolutely have those as free days, I'm going to be rejuvenated. So if we just extra, well, would that be your experience too? Because again, I'm a sample of one here. Yeah, I'm really bad at that. I, I take a lot of time off, probably, I don't know, 10, 11 weeks a year, but I don't take it off completely. And I don't know if I'm just making an excuse for myself because I don't have somebody back at the office. Like you have a team, you have a full team and I don't. So I don't know if I'm just, just basically giving myself a pass because I don't have anybody to check my email or answer client queries or something like that. But I will tell clients like, okay, I'm out this month. So let's extend the implementation period for a month. So you're not harmed here by my vacation plans. Uh, And then finishing up the last book, I took seven weeks off and I would check email in the afternoon. So I don't, I'm not really good at this, honestly. I'm, I'm a pretty terrible example of it. Is there a distinction between taking time off from the normal everyday work stuff to invest intellectually and research wise and just letting, putting your feet up and thinking on behalf of the business? So that's different in your mind than totally unplugging for the business. And how do you balance those two things? Yeah. Is there a difference? There probably is a difference. They're both, they're both, uh, forms of rejuvenation, but one would be more complete. I'm always struck by the fact that Warren Buffett has 300,000 employees, but he spends five hours a day during the business day reading. Reading, right. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, you know, is, well, you think, well, I I can't take time off because I have these six employees. Yeah. And he's got, (laughs) yeah. What lame excuses we tell ourselves. (laughs) It's, is it because I, you know, I I haven't figured that out really, but it, it is amazing. Like the business suffers if you're not putting your feet up and thinking on behalf of your business, but that doesn't, maybe that thinking shouldn't happen when you're on the beach and trying to unplug. Yeah. So before the concept was introduced to me by a strategic coach, I I never really thought of this. I didn't, I understood time off to be a reward for good behavior, Mm. right? You got a vacation for working hard. And then the first time, and my wife, who's, who's my business partner and such a hard worker, the first time we took, um, we took a 
four day vacation in Mexico. We uh, there was no work attached to it because you and I both travel a lot for work. We can kind of always attach a vacation to a work trip and essentially, you know, doesn't cost us anything or doesn't cost us much. We paid for this with real after tax dollars, no connection to business. I didn't think about business at all in the airport on the way home. I finally was able to turn my phone on. And, like I crossed the line. I said, OK, I'm going to work. And we're sitting in the lounge waiting for the plane. And my wife and my wife looks at me and she said, I, I cannot remember the last time I have seen you so energized. Mm. And so in that moment, she said, I get it. I finally get it. Time off is not reward for having you know, put in hard time at work. It's what's required to rejuvenate you. Time off is the priority that's required for creativity, innovation, and the energy that you need to bring to the business. So maybe we should flip that around, right? With a certain amount of rejuvenation, you are allowed to contribute at work. And when that contribution level starts to wane, then you are forced to go rejuvenate. And until that happens, you do not earn the right to contribute at the business again. You know, that's a really interesting idea. That's a, and we played with the idea of forced time off. When, when I started building a team and transitioning from a consulting practice, first we went, okay, we're not going to track paid time off, take whatever you want. And then I thought, no, I'm gonna, we're going to force people to take time off. That didn't really work either. It was a kind of an interesting, interesting experiment. But, the, you know, that's what you're suggesting. It's a really interesting idea. Is you, you need to earn the right to come here and contribute, by taking time off and re- rejuvenating. Yeah, That's exactly. an interesting concept. And uh, because the, the way – and we, we calculate, we call it PTO, paid time off. And in the in year, years ago, it was like, okay, you had to work – this was a really crazy idea, but you had to work at a firm for a year, and then you got two weeks of vacation. And then as yeah. people started switching jobs more frequently, it didn't make any sense for somebody in their mid-40s to go back to zero and have to work somewhere for a year before they got to t- take time off. So the whole industry, not just the creative industry that we serve, but the whole industry said, okay, it's paid time off. So you work for, so every month you earn this many days when we maybe ought to flip that around, like every, every few days you take off, you earn this amount, this amount of time to work. Picking up on an idea you mentioned a minute ago about this unlimited time off, there are a lot of studies that show that doesn't work very well, especially in, in the U.S. because People, what keeps people from taking time off is not the limit that HR puts on it, but this expectation that everybody around them has that yeah. you, yeah, that you shouldn't do that. And and I think that has to start at the top. So so changing that and forcing time off does make a lot of sense. And also too, you wouldn't want to say, okay, if you for some reason you can't take time off, then we'll pay you for those days. That really is counterproductive, right? If you don't take the time off, you're not getting the money because it it's really critical. You're listening to Two Bobs, conversations on the art of creative entrepreneurship. Your hosts are David C. Baker of Recourses, author, speaker, and advisor to owners of expert firms, and Blair Enns of Win Without Pitching, the sales training and coaching program for creative entrepreneurs. For more information, go to twobobs.com. If you find this podcast helpful, please help us by telling a friend and rating us on iTunes. Thank you. Now back to David and Blair. So... The four of us were somewhere overseas, um, just not plugged into work at all. I remember you accidentally checked your email one time, and I remember the crestfallen look on your face. It's like, oh, and it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't any it wasn't any big business problem or anything. It was just one of those normal things that comes up that that shows up in your email in basket. And I had still this is an area that I am still so bad about. I'm not. Well, I am. I'm addicted to email. I am addicted to email, partly because I don't like phone calls, right? And so that's a, a, a worthy substitute to me that I can manage socially, but it's still very difficult. When I don't have enough time off, I start to get grumpy and I start to not think. I don't think beyond just my to do list. I'm not really thinking deeper on behalf of my clients. I'm not thinking about what I need to do to develop IP, to write some insightful piece or whatever. What do you do? When you don't have an, like, what does Friday afternoon look like with Blair today, right before you leave the office? Are you unbearable? 
more unbearable, I'm not unbearable than normal. But you, you know, we've had some exchanges over the last few weeks where I've had to come back and apologize for my terseness, either the way I've treated you, but more often when we're talking about something else. And it's like, okay, I'm. And a few times I've said to you in our communications, you know, what, I just need a vacation. And what I, I wrote those words, but when you're reading them, you should probably read. <laughs> I just, I just need a vacation. <laughs> a whiny little two-year-old boy. Everything. I just need a little time off. Um, you know, so that's so. I tend, to, I can get a little terse, but more, more normal for me is my productivity level. My output just drops. It just drops. It kind of just goes down, 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 down. And then if I go away and unplug for just a few days, I will come back rejuvenated. But the longer I've been kind of stumbling around or fumbling around, then the more time off it's going to take. You know, what's interesting, Mm. I wanted to talk about this idea too. You use the phrase work-life balance. And some point about maybe 15 years ago, somebody, I don't remember who, said, we need to quit, especially entrepreneurs or, or solopreneurs or freelancers or free agents. So maybe it was Dan Pink um, said, we need, to, we need to quit talking about this idea of work-life balance. And we need to talk about work-life management because the nature of work these days increasingly looks like entrepreneurship. Mm. And so vacations very often are tied to work. You know, you get invited to speak in some location. OK, we're going to bring the, the spouse and kids. Etc. And, and so I think that's a really helpful idea that we can let go of maybe some older notions mm. of the need for work-life balance, especially as an entrepreneur. But at the same time, and here I go with two opposable ideas, at the same time, I really do think you need to carve out those times in your calendar when you are completely unplugged from work, completely right. unplugged, where you are not – again, that, that includes not thinking deeply about work. And that, that means not reading business books. And I always have multiple books on the go, um, and most of them are business books. So that's then, – then you've got to read fiction. I used to love that, but I feel like now when I'm reading fiction, I feel like I, I'm forced to read it. <laughs> Because I'm not allowed to read business yeah, stuff. Yeah, right. You, yeah, you're wasting time because you're now you're not knocking books off your business pile. What? So as you work with um, principals and you talk with you, you get pretty. You get to see deep inside their lives, and and it's not just on the surface. What do you? What are the patterns there? How do you give them more permission? Like as you talk with them about how their business will be better if they aren't as involved without breaks. Do they buy that argument? What what other things do you do to help give them permission to take more time off and start enjoying it? Because nobody does that and doesn't enjoy it. They're always grateful for it. But how do you give them permission for it? You know, I find a lot of the um, a lot of the principles that I deal with are trying to fill multiple well two two roles simultaneously that they shouldn't they need to give one up. Mm. And obviously the smaller the firm the more roles one person is going to be failing. Right. But I think there's a great book out there. If you're familiar with uh, um, the entrepreneurial operating system, so it's EOS Worldwide, their first book is Gino Wickman is the name, and his first book is called Traction. But I think it's his fourth book. It's called Rocket Fuel. And in that book, he he defines the two key roles in an entrepreneurial organization. One he calls the visionary and the other he calls the integrator. So the visionary is kind of a creative, big thinker, focusing on future value, gets people inspired, we're going in this direction, etc., takes risks, etc. And the integrator is really the operations person who like makes everything happen, who holds people accountable, who puts systems in place. And if the, the thing that I find myself talking to agency principals about a lot these days is this idea, most, because most of them are the classic visionary, and they don't have this number two, this COO integrator, and they're horrible integrators. They're horrible. Right. Uh, yeah, it's a generalization. But the, the more of a visionary you are, the more difficult it is for you to take care of operations. And they can't step aside because it's because of the operational issues, right? It's not because, yeah, right. you know, and if you want to be a better visionary, man, you need time off. You need to be rejuvenated. If you're in the business of coming up with ideas and inspiring your team to say, we're going this way, follow me. You know, you can't be like, if I tried to do that now, I'd be like, okay, people, we're, yeah. what's next? We're, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're going this way. 
but first I'm going to have a nap. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right? So, and part of the reason I'm so tired is I'm determined. I've, I've crafted next year. I've let go of everything. There's only a couple of big things left on my to-do list, but I have effectively let go of everything. So in 2018, I'm traveling the world and speaking, and I'm doing one other thing that I'm not going to talk about here, but I'm essentially traveling and speaking. Um, So I'm busy putting all the places, things in place and letting go of things. And I'm expecting that next year, because uh, I get, I find travel when it's done properly, rejuvenating. And when you try to pack too much in, it's it's the opposite. Mm-hmm. But it can be rejuvenating. It can be luxurious when you do it right. And I get a lot of great ideas. So I expect to be kind of, you know, coming back to the office between trips and inspiring people with new ideas and um, and new things that we might develop, new places we might go, etc. So. That's I'm really trying to un- let go of the last of the integrator stuff that I have. And the truth is I don't have much anymore. There's other projects that I'm just finishing up that I'm letting go of to free myself up to be that visionary. So back to your question, I always bring it back to me because it's my favorite topic. Right? Yeah, there right. I said it. But back to your question, what do I say to the principals? I usually use this framework of the visionary integrator and suggest, strongly suggest that they read that book and they think about going out and getting a number two. And what I'm surprised by is how difficult it is for people to do that. Mm. Yeah, for the pers- the principal, not necessarily the person yeah, they're going to hire. Now that you asked the question, I've given you the answer and I'm thinking about, well, how often do people take that advice? And I'm thinking, not very often. Mm. Yeah, but when I think about firms that are really well run, that is a very common characteristic. And usually both of them, both of those partners are filling roles, but it doesn't have to be that way. The integrator doesn't have to be a partner, but right. uh, there is the the strong presence of the one and the other. Um, you And it's, it's almost like on this work-life slash vacation discussion we're having here, uh, the the inspirational or the you know the, this person besides the integrator they almost have to take a vacation from the integration role of work every day or they're being asked something's being asked of them they're just not it's just not in their wheelhouse they're just not good at that and and it's it's interesting that that's also how we probably ought to help our listeners think about this growth thing because the the role of integration becomes more and more important as the the firm gets larger and if you don't address that integration um, role as the firm grows it will get worse for you it will not get better yeah and if regard if you're in the visionary role or the integrator role and you can't take time off like i you just like how can you do your job? Hey, this is me admonishing me. Like Marcus is going to title this Blair Needs a Vacation, isn't he? Yeah, right. And if we recorded this the day after you got back from vacation, it might be a little bit different. So we're, we're hitting your, at, your, uh, at your most feverish moment. What about, um, ex- what about, I guess we would just call it a sabbatical, but something that's not quite as frequent but longer in nature. And sometimes people give themselves permission to work on a business project like it could be writing some extended writing project or something have you taken what could be considered a sabbatical in your in your business life i haven't but when i think forward to next year it's not really a sabbatical i'm actually you know yeah i'm talking about being a little bit burned out and it's a bit of an exception for me this isn't kind of my normal state um and I am overstating it a little bit, but like I don't actually see in my own business, I can only speak for myself here, I don't actually see the need for a sabbatical. But I am in some ways thinking about next year as I'm lining up these trips now, I'm thinking about you know the re- rejuvenation potential of these trips. And I'm very excited about it, about letting go. Just the, the fact of leaving means that there's certain things that I can't do. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I'm just going to focus on the things that I can do. I'm going to show up. I'm going to speak. I'm, do, I'm going to meet with clients. I'm going to run a few sales events. And that's about it. And that's all I'm going to have the capacity to do. So the more I'm the more and the longer I'm out of the office, the less likely I am to get dragged back into this stuff. I don't know... You know, I've had a lot of conversations with principals about their exit, their desire to exit. Mm-hmm. And I've shared with them an article that I wrote. It's on 
my website, winwithoutpitching.com. It's called The Mission with No Exit. And I say, here, have, have a read of this and then let's talk. And very often they're inspired about not exiting, not selling after that. But a lot of times when the principal who's like looking forward to the, they just need a vacation. Exactly. I mean, when I hear people talk about um, one of those like extended sabbaticals, it's often like out of desperation because they haven't been taking enough vacations. Or sometimes it's a way to get rid of a partner because you're not sure what to do with them and you're hoping that they'll – so there's more than one partner and you're hoping that this one partner will leave and figure out what they want to do with their life while they're gone. And when they come back, maybe there will be less tension around that discussion. Uh, So that I have a a kind of a weird view of sabbaticals. It seems like a sabbatical is what you do if you haven't taken enough time off during every year. I think that's fair enough, and if and and I think you and I would both agree there are situations where people need to have a sabbatical. But then when you come back, something has to fundamentally change, and if it hasn't fundamentally changed, then you know what was the point of the sabbatical other than saving yourself? So you save yourself temporarily, and then you show up and you repeat the cycle again. Right, right. Go right back. Nothing's changed. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this has been very interesting. I'm uh, excited uh, for your vacation coming up later today, <laughs> as are everybody around you, probably. Yeah. Uh, th- this is interesting. I hope um, we need to explore some of these areas some more, and we need to talk more about this this succession idea and about your article about um, you know never leaving your business but always being excited about it. That's something that uh, I think will be very interesting to our, our listeners. Thank you, Blair. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you for listening to Two Bobs with David C. Baker and Blair Enns. Subscribe and learn more at twobobs.com. That's the number two, B-O-B-S dot com.